I'd like us, strangely enough, to begin with a poem written by a Persian, a 13th century Persian poet. And in the spirit of Ralph Cook, that we can glean from secular, not even Jewish secular, but purely universal knowledge and saying that we don't compartmentalize necessarily between Jewish thought and universal thought. I'd like to begin with this poem to get us into our topic today of sadness, tears, and action. The guest house. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out, for some new delight, the dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door, laughing and invite them in. I'm sorry, it just occurred to me, I did not share the screen. <laughs> Am I right? You're right. Okay, why didn't anybody say something? Okay, I'm gonna read it again. The guest house, this human being is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows, who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. What do you think is being talked about here? It's certainly a metaphor. What does it mean to say that we are a guest house and who Rumi is suggesting are the guests? I'm just thinking that it's all the different kinds of emotions that creep up on us and you know, sometimes the memories, and we're not always prepared for the memories that sort of come suddenly. And we ourselves are that house, and we sort of have to be grateful for whatever we can feel. And you know, I think try and uh, accept it, and not uh, shy away from it. Okay, you put that very interestingly, Beth. That I, I be don't... grateful for whatever we feel. Can you say a little more about that? Uh, again, you know, whenever, when, when, you know, our emotions are, are very strong sometimes, and uh, we have to let them, we, we have to let them be sometimes so that we can uh, either, I, I guess, accept them or uh, cope with them. And if, and if we try and shy away from it, then we're not facing that. And we sort of just have to face whatever comes our way. Thank you. Yes. I look, I look at it as there isn't a person that cannot contribute something to you, whether it's knowledge or, um, or moral or whatever. Every, I think each and every one of us has something to contribute. Bracha, I, For sure. I, but go on, Marlene. I, I think it's important to realize that as human beings, I don't know. I keep hearing static. I'm not sure why. Oh, I know why. Um, that as human beings, we 
all have a variety of emotions within us. And I think that in order to really be human, we have to recognize those emotions and live each day with whatever comes our way. I like the, um, the last few lines um, about being grateful for whatever comes because each one of those emotions really is sent as a, as a guide from beyond. It, it, lead, it will lead you down different paths um, and uh, what may be sadness one day can turn into joy another. Yes, putting together both responses from Marlene and Bev, absolutely. And when you say be grateful for whatever comes, that might strange, sound strange to some. You know, why would you be grateful for something that's not particularly positive, but as Marlene just said, and we'll uh, look at this at the very end, sometimes the juxtaposition is very, very important and even heightens the positive. If you've had that experience of the sadness, absolutely. We live in an age, if you watch TVs, or listen to the radio and all the advertisements for stuff trying to give you the ability to escape some emotions, it's fair of me to ask, do we really welcome every emotion? Are we honest with ourselves? And do we acknowledge that sometimes we are afraid to face how we truly feel, because it's difficult. It's difficult, but are we going to achieve a full life, a full life, if we don't have that broken heart? It takes courage to face uncomfortable feelings. I'm sure we all know that. And there's a field in psychology these days called affect tolerance, affect tolerance. And it's a belief that we must learn to embrace uncomfortable feelings and stop fighting them. It's not pleasant. Now it hope, helps to know that they will pass, hopefully. But yeah. feelings truly are teachers. They are teachers. And what I'd like us to do today is look at a few aspects of sadness and issues that come up revolving around that emotion and our role as somebody who might feel the sadness or someone who is with someone who's feeling that sadness. So, we will use our wonderful sources to help us along this path. Now, first of all, we're going to look at a text from the Talmud, a story, a narrative, um, revolving around Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai that we have mentioned a few times recently. The great leader who as a corpse, had himself moved out secretly to build Yavna as Jerusalem was falling so that study could continue. Well, he loses a child and some of his students come supposedly to comfort him. Now, I want you to follow closely what each of the students says and I'll read it all together and then you'll give your sense of what they're doing here. Rabbi Eliezer entered and sat before Yochanan ben Zakkai. And he said, Rabbi, may I say something before you? He said to him, say. He said to him, Adam the first, had a son who died and he accepted consolation. 
How do we know that he accepted consolation? As it says, and Adam again knew his wife. So to you accept consolation. Yochanan ben Zakkai replies to his student Eliezer and says, is it not enough for me that I am troubled with my own problems, but you remind me of the pain of Adam? The second student comes, Rabbi Yoshua entered and he said, would you like me to say a thing before you? He said to him, say, he said to him, Eo, Job, had sons and daughters, and they all died on one day. And he accepted consolation over them. So too, you accept consolation. How do we know that Job accepted consolation? As it says, God gave, God took. Let the name of God be blessed. He said to him, is it not enough for me that I am troubled with my own problems, but you remind me of the pain of Job? Third student, you're seeing a pattern. Rabbi Yossi entered and sat before him. He said, Rabbi, would you like me to say a thing before you? He said to him, say, he said to him, Aharon had two adult sons, and they both died on one day. And he accepted consolation over them, as it says. And Aaron was silent. Silence is nothing but consolation. <clears throat> so too, <coughs> you accept consolation. He said to him, is it not enough for me that I am troubled, troubled with my own problems? but you remind me of the pain of Aaron? <coughs> you would think that he would have learned by now to not agree for them to speak. <coughs> Rabbi Shimon entered and he said, would you like me to say a thing before you? He said to him, say, he said to him, King David had a son who died. I'm sorry, just give me a moment. <coughs> and he accepted consolation over him. So too, you accept consolation. How do we know that David accepted? As it says, David consoled Bathsheba, his wife, and he came into her and lay with her, and she gave birth to a son. So too, you accept consolation. <coughs> he said to him, is it not enough for me that I am troubled and my own problems, but you remind me now of the pain of David. Finally, <coughs> Rabbi Elazar ben Arach, Elazar enters. When he saw him, he said to his attendant, take my things and come after me to the bathhouse. He's going to the bathhouse now because he's getting up from Shiva. <clears throat> Rabbi Elazar says, I will tell you an analogy. What is the thing like? A person to whom the king entrusted a package. Every day he would cry and scream and say, woe to me. When will I get out of this responsibility in peace? So you, Rabbi, you had a son. He read Torah, Tanakh, Mishnah, laws, and Agadot, and he departed from the world without sin. You should accept consolation when you return your package intact. Rabbi Yochanan responds, Rabbi Elazar, my son, you have consoled me as people console. What is it? that the four students before Rabbi Elazar were doing, 
Were they doing something that we should commend? No, because when you go to a Shiva house, first of all, you don't talk or you ask questions about the deceased. And <coughs> that's what the last one did. He talked about how wonderful his son was. So you're right. That's the first thing that was incorrect. Some people aren't aware of this, but when you go to a Shiva house, you are not meant to immediately start talking because you're not sure where the mourner is at. And so you're meant, even though it can be uncomfortable because you're just sitting there, it is meant for the mourner to start the conversation. Okay, but when these four students start, they fail to comfort their teacher. And I would suggest it's that they themselves, they're not trying to hurt him. Not at all, there's no way. But they themselves cannot stand to witness his grief. Their teacher's sadness makes them feel uncomfortable. So they use Torah to hide their own discomfort. They teach, but they do not empathize. Unlike Elazar, who you can see Yochanan trusted would do okay, because that's why he immediately said to him, come, let's go to the mikvah. Elazar validated Yochanan's experience. And he treated his teacher as a normal human being who is experiencing difficult feelings. And there's go no going around that. Anybody else a comment about? Now, I also must say, I love the way the Talmud would bring in um, stories that don't necessarily show the better side of our sages. They are human too. And there's something to learn about that. Just as there's a great story about an ill-fated Bikur Cholim visit that we'll look at or have looked at at another time. Okay. Um, and I think this is a scenario that is very real for many of us have a difficult time, not just dealing with our own sadness, when we have to be there for somebody else and you're not exactly sure what to say. And sometimes you feel that you've got to say something and you end up saying something often hopefully good, but sometimes you say after, oh my God, how did I say that? Um, without bad intention without. Uh -huh. Let's go ahead. It also seems to me that when he turned things around and talked about his son and the good qualities of the son, the other thing that he did was turn around the perception. So as opposed to it's a loss of this wonderful person, thank goodness you experienced this gift of this wonderful person. And I think that's a very different way oh, and is yeah. also something that we always say may you be blessed with happy memories and things like that that you experience the gift of this person and that can be very consoling but people look i'm sorry just uh, brenda i think that is so important what you just said because that's what we live on and it it makes the mourner sitting there i think have a feeling that you could sit there not just for a week because as people come and begin to tell you stories, wonderful stories about the person you've just lost, it, it, it does wonders to your heart. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. Rafa, yeah. when you have somebody come in and they're talking about somebody else's pain as a yeah. way to make you feel better, that, that's crazy because yes. that's the last thing you wanna hear. Just as the, the person, I think Brenda said, um, it's got to be positive. So you don't want to bring up other people's pain and say, you see, your pain maybe isn't as bad as theirs, so you shouldn't feel so bad. No, yeah. you have to talk about things that are positive. Uh, you Absolutely. know, I'm just thinking, in fact, each of those demeaned the mourner's pain. 
in my mind, it was demeaning to, to, to take away from acknowledging his pain. So uh, to follow along what Michael just said. Yeah, I agree. But again, to their defense, and that's why I began uh, the way I did, that um, it wasn't intentional that they wanted to demean, but they really just weren't thinking. Um, and it could be that they just weren't comfortable with it. Yes, Stephen, I see your hand up, but you're on mute. <coughs> Stephen, you're on mute. You're still on mute. <coughs> Stephen, go ahead. It looks like you're off mute now. Just turn up your volume, maybe. Steve? <clears throat> I guess not. Okay, Bracha? Okay, I see Elliot's hand is up. Yes, uh, I, I came in a little late, so I might have missed something. I wonder if taking somebody to the bathhouse or mikvah is just a, a form of evasion, number one. And number two, uh, I've been to shiva houses when people come by and they say to the mourner, that standard trite expression, rattle it off, may God comfort you among the mourners of Zion. And I um, think their voice and their body language is just rattling off the mantra. What I say to people is, uh, hopefully I'll see you during better days. That's what I say. Okay, and you can continue saying that, but to the defense, you know, any wonderful lines uh, can be said in an unmeaningful way. But if you think about, and we could spend an entire session on that line, what that's meant to convey is that you are within a community. And, 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 and make sure that you take from the community that you're not alone. Okay, I don't want to elaborate I, I on bet. that now. Well, now I'm, was, on, I'm on now. My, okay. my point was the body language and the tone of voice when one utters that mantra can make a difference. It can seem like something just rattled off. It's a piece of technology, so to speak, or it's said with a sense of real empathy. I'm talking about the body language, looking at the person, the tone of voice can make a big difference in communication. Of course, but that can be said about everything. Okay. Steve. I'm back. Steven. Yes, okay. So many, a number of years ago, 20 odd years ago, I was at a funeral, not a shiva, and it was a young man, about 26 years old. And the only girlfriend he ever had was his wife, since they were 16 years old or something. They had three children. She died in 24 hours. She, it, it was a sudden illness hit her and she died. There was a thousand people at Benjamin's. They used the Home Depot parking lot. Mm -hmm. And Howard got up and said, with his broken heart, when the day comes, my children, my three little children grow up and can comprehend in our adults. I want each of you to make a promise to yourself that you will come and see my children and tell them the stories that how you knew her in your way, how you related to her, because you related to her, each of you differently than I did. Uh, I mean, it was the, the one time I've ever heard a plea like that, a request like that. Thank you. Yeah, you're confirming what Brenda just said. Okay, well, let's go on. So we've just said. Yes. Yeah. It, what you talked about reminds me of people look at things differently. There is a story in the Talmud about a man whose wife died at childbirth. And he said, what am I going to do? How am I going to feed the child? And God gave him breast so that he will be able to feed the child. That's a Talmud story. And two rabbis interpreted the condition that the man was in completely different. One looked at it as a positive, the other one looked at it as a negative. Okay, interesting tale. Um, now. But it does relate to, to the situation. It depends, different people react differently 
and of course. sit differently. Of course, of course. Okay, so we've established that we should not run away from feelings, even difficult feelings. We've established that you must show that understanding of the situation a mourner is in and let him be sad and go through that. And now though, we're going to suggest that as much empathy that you might show a person in such a difficult situation, it's limited. You can only comfort the person so much. I've mentioned um, a Dr. Erica Brown before, a biblical scholar and educator. And in the context of the deaths of the three teenagers, I think it was 2014 that had been kidnapped and we prayed for so long that they'd be found, um, but they were not, they were killed by the terrorists. And then the three mothers became very well known throughout the country being very, very strong. But I remember coming here and uh, being a part of that feeling of the entire country praying, just praying that these three young boys would be found alive. So that leads us, Erica Brown discusses that in the context of this pasuk from Judges. Through the window peered Sisera's mother. Behind the lattice, she sighed. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why so late the clatter of his wheels? So I don't know if you're familiar with Sisera, but this is no ordinary mother. She is a mother of a cruel enemy general who oppressed us for years, but the text has chosen to push that aside. We're only looking at the pain of a mother here. And she goes on to say the following. As a community, we have all been waiting by that window. She's writing this in 2014. As a community, we have all been waiting by that window for weeks, checking the news constantly and asking if there are any updates, any developments about our three kidnapped boys. We prayed for them, thought of them, cried for them. We told ourselves that the army would find them. It was just a matter of time. All most of us could really think about was what it must be like to be a parent of one of those boys at that hour and for every other hour after that. Our own sacred texts demand that we do this as a sign of compassion, pushing away the politics and prognoses that will inevitably follow a tragedy like this for one simple moment, the moment a parent who is waiting finds out the terrible news that he or she has lost a child. We have all been in some psychic, mystical way, the parents, brothers, sisters, and friends of those boys, Eyal Yifrach and Naftali Frankel and Gilad Shar. This bond of connection and concern runs deep in tears, in friendship, in helplessness, we waited by the window with the families of these boys. Yet, at the end of the day, our verse in Judges reminds us that we are not the parents. Whatever closeness and pain we experience can never come close to that of the families who lost those children. Sister is mother does not stand with her friends at that window. She stands alone. We can never presume to understand someone else's most intimate pain. We have our own pain as a community, an extended family that has lost three young lights. It translates and extends itself, but also has a limit. 
we go on when those who sit on the floor <coughs> in mourning cannot imagine they ever will. Can you relate to that? <coughs> if you can get people talking and there is a trust <coughs> or a bond between someone in pain and get them to describe their own feelings about it rather than for us to assume we understand their feelings. Uh, I, Bracha, I've taught this stuff for decades. I'd love it if you could define how you perceive empathy as opposed to sympathy. Technically, they're quite different. And the question is, there are people who may not want to invest the energy or time to try to be more empathetic. Do you have any suggestions? Well, I think what it's suggesting is <clears throat> we all should be sympathetic. Some of us can definitely be empathetic because we've experienced something like that. But as empathetic as you might be, even somebody, a mother who lost her child two years before that comes, isn't going through that exactly in the same way now. But I'm bringing this <coughs> as just another aspect of something we might encounter <coughs> through sadness and this, this is in no way to tell us we stay away from somebody who's in pain because some people do. Some people do, and for the ridiculous, some of the most ridiculous reasons that I've heard, even though I believe they might be not being honest with themselves. They don't realize that it means so much to the mourner. And I'm not just talking about mourning. Anybody who's going through a difficult time and needs sympathy. <clears throat> Empathy, you just have this sense that it's a stronger feeling and that because you've had such an experience. Um, but we praise Rav Elazar, but that's not enough. Like you have to know that it might be time to leave your rabbi alone. Let Yochanan right. ben Sakai be on his own because you can only take him so far. He has to go through this. Okay, I want to move on to suggesting um, that we all need to cry. You know, I'm, I might drive you crazy because last week I stressed that we should come and pray to God, Bismcha, enjoy. Now I know that you know already that nothing is either or, black and white. But today, we're going to make a case that we have to cry. All of us, we have to let ourselves cry when it's called upon. And not just females or older people, but everyone should have that sense and emotion within them, or else, as it's been said, we are not whole. So I'm going to bring you what might seem a little odd, a story, some sukim about Rachel and Leah to say how important it is in our tradition to cry. So we know the conflict that was going on between Rachel and Leah. Rachel became envious of Leah because she was having children and Leah couldn't lose sight and memory of the fact that her husband loved, preferred Rachel. And this is going on inside of them for years. Now, Lavan had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were tender. Sometimes it's 
translated swollen or weak, but Rachel had beautiful features and a beautiful complexion. Now, this is very strange for the Torah to give a negative description of a woman. It is so concerned even about animals that it doesn't like calling an unkosher animal impure. It will say the animal that is not pure. Anyway, so it's strange. So the rabbis discuss this. Why would the Torah have described Leah in such a not uh, pretty way? It sounds terrible. She has swollen eyes. So the rabbis discuss and say, Rav says that there is a different explanation of the verse. Actually, the verse means that her eyes were literally weak. And this is not a denigration of her, but a praise of her. Why? As she would hear people at the crossroads coming from the land of Canaan, who would say, Rebecca has two sons. Who were those sons? Who were Rebecca's sons? Rebecca and Isaac. Jacob and Isaac. Jacob and Esau. So she has these two sons. And in those days, very often cousins married each other. And her brother Lavan has two daughters. The older daughter will be married to the older son and the younger daughter will be married to the younger son. So Leah would hear this and it says, and she would sit at the crossroads and ask, what are the deeds of the older son? The passers-by would answer, he is an evil man and he robs people. She would ask, what are the deeds of the younger son? And they would answer, he is a quiet man dwelling in tents. And because she was so distraught at the prospect of marrying the evil brother, Esau, she would cry and pray for mercy until her eyelashes fell out. And since the weakness of her eyes was due to this cause, characterizing her eyes as weak constitutes praise. What that means is Leah was concerned about raising a family with a worthy man who would bring up his children in a desirable way. And when she believed that she was going to be matched with Asaph, who she heard these negative things about, she cried, prayed with tears. And so the rabbis feel that's why the Torah allowed her to be described that way, pointing to something that is praiseworthy. There are times we pray to God with joy. But then there are other times we pray. And it's said that a kiss or a nice word sometimes can be contrived. But it's very hard to, to start crying unless you're a paid actor on your own to be able to do that. And so tears are really beyond words. So now, the next question about crying. Who should we cry for? Now, tell me. Who do you tend to cry for more? Uh, what do I mean? Things about yourself or things about somebody else? Times that involve somebody else and what they're going through? Think. Well, it depends who the somebody else is. If your own child is not well, your crying is, is different than if you cry for a friend or a neighbor. Okay, but now to answer my question, so what you've just said, you immediately said you're crying for somebody else, whether it's 
a child or a friend of a neighbor. Anybody else? Somebody else. Okay, why is that, Sarah? Because when I hear about the plight of the Ukrainians, some days I just can't take it. And I break down. They, they, what they're going through is horrific. Some of these people. Um, and I have to let out my, I don't know, my grief, my, my anger, my, my horrible feelings for Putin. <laughs> You know, it it's some days it's just too much, and some days I'll I'll cry in the car when I'm driving because I'm hearing things that I can't stand. Okay, and that will make you cry more than about something to do with you personally. Even though what I'm saying, as I'm saying it, isn't nice because it's as if I'm saying this shouldn't be personally important to you. But I mean your own individual being. But, but Bracha, sometimes the fact that you are crying and you think it's re for somebody else is really, you really are crying for yourself because the, the plight that that person is in has an effect on your life and though you're sad for them, um, the sadness is going to impact on you. So you're, you may be crying for them, but you're also crying for yourself at the same time. Okay, I think you're Rocha. being honest there. Rocha. Yeah, Rocha, I think it would yes. be good to take a, can, can I speak or not? <laughs> Wait, if somebody else began. Who else? It was me, Merle. Merle, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say, I'm sitting outside and there's a plane. I was just going to say that um, I don't think that the two kinds of emotion are, are mutually exclusive. Like, I think there are times when we need to cry for ourselves because we need to. And there are so many times we need to, want to and need to cry for those, for those around us or for situations that we would love to be able to control and can't. And I just think that maybe it, it's, the you know, it, it's the permission we give ourselves to feel in whichever situation we're in. You know, we hear sometimes of people saying, oh, like they never cried at whatever, you know, a parent's funeral. But you know, so we need to give ourselves that permission no matter what the situation to be able to, to have emotion. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and of course, you're right about that they're not mutually exclusive. I'm only asked, sometimes I ask a question like that to get us into the text that I'm going to want to share. But of course, thank you. So let's look at this interesting, very brief verse. When Yosef, after all these years, meets up again with his little brother, Benjamin, and he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. The he, the first day, is Yosef. So the question is, previously, he hugged the brothers, but he didn't cry. Why do you think with Benjamin, there's this added emotion of crying? Anybody? He was his only real brother. All right, they shared the same mother. Also, Benjamin was not involved in the plot. He's also, our, he's also for crying for the years that he missed in the relationship with his brother, as is Benjamin crying for the years he missed um, in the, his relationship with Joseph. Okay, yeah. In addition, our sages envision in the Midrash that Joseph was mourning prophetically, seeing something that's going to be in the future over the Beit HaMikdash in Yerushalayim, eventually being destroyed. 
And he was crying about that with Benjamin because Benjamin's tribe was apportioned the region where the Beit Hamikdash was going to be built. So Joseph begins to cry, feeling badly for Benjamin and that loss. The rabbis continue to say that Benjamin was crying over Yosef because the tribe of Yosef was apportioned the region where the sanctuary in Shiloh was established. So the rabbis asked a very interesting question. Each brother was weeping for the other's loss. Why did each one cry over the other's future calamity? They were facing similar fates. Why then didn't they both cry for themselves? Anybody want, before I share the response, Hazal give? Could it be that his brother said, were thinking of their father because Joseph was so important, but later on in history, Judah is the one who got the main inheritance, the main part. I don't know that that hits on this because they're crying with each other. And the, just according to this Midrash, what's the point that the rabbis are trying possibly to make? Instead of you, crying for they their can, own. But they can when cry- you love someone, for the loss Russell, of when you, when you love Michael. someone, and when you love someone, you care more about that person than yourself. That's what I believe. So that like he loved his brother and his brother loved him. And therefore what happened to his brother was more concerning than what happened to himself. And I think every parent will say that. What happens to my kids is more important than me. Okay. And so the woman who's been married to you, as you told us last week for 50 years is a lucky woman, okay? <laughs> um, the rabbis go on to say that there's a world of difference between how we regard a disaster of our own as opposed to that of our fellow. This is gonna be a little different from what you've all said. You know, to the other, sometimes all we can do is cry and offer an intangible love, but the final outcome is not up to us when it comes to somebody else. We, on the other hand, as much as our tradition says there's a time to cry, it's incumbent upon us to realize that we dare not tearfully resign ourselves to our disaster or difficult time. Follow this. You know, as much as we want to help somebody else, and that is critical, but sometimes we can only go to a certain point but you certainly have to show the emotional support. But when it comes to my own individual being, the rabbis say, I can't just give up and cry because I'm the only one who has control over me. Think about that. We can't allow ourselves to give in, to give in. It's not easy, but, but, sometimes, but sometimes it's important to allow yourself to cry and then say enough is enough. No, that's what I just said. It doesn't mean you can't cry, but you can't then say that's where it ends. You have to then build yourself up again. Okay, so we're seeing we cry, we cry for somebody else and we definitely can feel. We're allowed to feel, but in looking out for us, it's not being cruel to say, don't end there with just tears. That's not cruel. That's wanting you to be able to survive and realize that you can go on. Okay, now another. 
But are tears enough? Are tears enough? Okay. So we're going to now look at the other sister in a different context, Rachel. So you know that Rachel, a few hours ago, I just passed by the sign that said, not too far from me, Kever Rachel, if I wanted to make my way to her burial spot. As you know, she was buried on the way to Efrat and Beit Lechem and not with the others. Okay, that's one of the beauties of living here where it's a real blackboard. Um, so she is considered to be the mother of our people who envisioned that because she's close to the spot where she is, that when we come back from exile, she will greet them. That she was mourning for the exile, but never gives up on the hope that we will return. Mm -hmm. And the famous line, Rachel mevata albaneha, that Rachel cries and weeps for her children. Now, that's all of our children. So in Yirmiyahu, it says the following. So says the Lord, a voice is heard on high, lamentation, bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children, for they are not. So says the Lord to Rachel. Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. Now, not he's not telling her to stop crying because it's not a good thing, but he wants her to know and be optimistic. For there is reward for your work, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. So the rabbis... Um, and modern day Rabbi David Foreman makes a very, very interesting point. He says, if you look at that pasuk very closely, what is she being rewarded for? It says, Ki yesh you're going to get an award, reward for your activities, for your work. But he says, all she's been doing is crying. Now, this David Foreman is very big on seeing words in one chapter of a book and seeing that those same words appear elsewhere. And he says, there has to be something that Rachel did beyond crying. If it says that she's going to be rewarded for her work. Now, what is that? Remember, that Leah has a child named Reuven, Reuben. Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and he found dudaim, some kind of plant, in the field and brought them to Leah, his mother. And Rachel said to Leah, now give me some of your son's dudaim. Now, how would you respond to that? Anybody want, before I go on, why would Rachel, remember a little while ago, I referred to the conflict between them. Can anyone see why Rachel might possibly be asking to have a little of what Leah's son, Ruvain, has brought? And remember, she's still There's no in children. such distress. Anyone? It's supposed to be some sort of a, a, a plant that um, increased the, the love and fertility. So she hadn't had any kids yet. And she thought by having this plant that uh, that would help her okay. to get to her husband. That is one way of looking at it. That is one way of looking at it. Rabbi Foreman suggests something else. He says, <clears throat> and it's just a thought but it's a nice thought that Rachel, who we've said has been resentful 
that Leah's having all the children and Leah has resented Rachel for the love she has from Jacob, that Rachel, he believes, is almost saying, you know, I don't have a child. Can I have that experience of knowing what it's like to receive something from a child? Hmm. It might be a stretch, but she is, but why? Because he's saying she also would prefer feeling that than being resentful. However, look how Leah answers her. And she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken my husband, that you wish also to take my son's dudaim? So Rachel said, therefore he shall sleep with you tonight as payment for your son's dudaim. When Jacob came from the field, in fact, in the evening, and Leah came forth toward him, and she said, you shall come to me because I have hired you with my son's dudaim. And he slept with her on that night. Now think about it. What Foreman is suggesting is, it's not enough to cry. Tears are good, but that's not enough. He's taking us to another step. You have to act. And he's saying, Rachel was unbelievable in what she did here. She changed her whole way of thinking about Leah. She wasn't aware of how resentful Leah was. She was consumed with how resentful she was of Leah because Leah had children. And so she comes to understand where Leah's at also. And therefore, that's why she offers Jacob to her. Even though Leah had just responded in the previous pasuk so angrily. And David Foreman just gives this as an example. Here we have Rachel, who's known to be the mother who weeps, but even for her, that's not enough. Now, perhaps it is that the weeping will be a catalyst for action. Perhaps, just as tears sometimes, you know, let's say you have siblings who have been out of touch or in conflict for a long, long time and they meet and they hug just like Yaakov and Esau did. Maybe those tears kind of lighten the memories, the horrific memories and lets you see things a little differently. So action is very, very important. Just a couple of more points. Who do you think is more likely to cry in this scenario? Joseph meets up now with his father, Yaakov. And Joseph harnessed his chariot and he went up to meet Israel, Yaakov, his father to Goshen. And he appeared to him and he fell on his neck and he wept on his neck for a long time. Now, in the English and in the Hebrew, we don't know which one it means when it says that he wept. Who do you think wept? Was it Yaakov, Israel, or Joseph, and why? Now, you might say it's both, but that's a cop-out right now from my point. <laughs> I think it's Joseph because Joseph knew what he had done. Like, he never contacted his dad, and he put him through such misery. And if anything, uh, Jacob, although he, he's very happy to see his son, he must have said, what the heck, didn't you? Why didn't you contact me? You were like almost the king of Egypt. You could have easily got word to me somehow. So I, I'm pretty sure it was Joseph who did the crying in that one. Okay, everybody agree with Michael? Not necessarily. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm thinking that, uh, that Yaakov was, was crying because he was so grateful that his son Joseph was alive. And uh -huh. after, having... Yeah not seen him for so many years and having had that thought for so many years to see him alive with his own eyes was such a relief. Okay. Yaakov could have also felt guilty because he was the one who sent Joseph to go towards the brothers. Yes. 
Okay, I think that each of them had something they might have been regretful about. Yosef, uh, yes, as Michael said, for not having contacted his father and for perhaps stirring up the brother's jealousy. And Yaakov might have regretted that he favored, appeared to favor Joseph and um, sent Joseph at one point to his brothers, which led to we know what. Shimshon Raphael Hirsch says, it's Yosef. He says, because Yaakov was alone and sad for so many years, he is probably all dried up. Yosef, on the other hand, was busy leading this nation, helping bakers and butlers interpret their dreams so that he now had the opportunity to let out all his suppressed emotions. Nachmanides, Ramban, he says, it's probably Yaakov. Why? Because he has the emotions of an elderly father. And that would be the natural, for whatever reason, that an older person, even a father, even a man, tends to cry more. Any of you noticing that? I'm not gonna put you on the spot. That you get a little teary-eyed more than you would have if you were 30 years younger. Mm-hmm. Or you might've been somebody that did that as well. Now, the Parshanim also point out, just as an aside, that Yaakov was the first of the Avot to cry in front of his children. And he thinks that's one of the reasons why we are called B'nai Yisrael. Another theory, because we are meant to be human and be able to feel and share the different emotions. These are all just means to get us to think about all aspects of this emotion. And to conclude, our last point, juxtaposition of sadness and happiness. So you might be familiar with what's called Tu Ba'av, the 15th of Av. It was a day established in the time of the Talmud where young women would go out into the fields dressed in white looking for worthy husbands. And it's still, happens today, they make it into something uh, fun. um, And it's of course very joyous. So Tuba Av is six days after Tisha B'Av. And we know that Tisha B'Av is a day of destruction morning. Similarly, Sukkot, even if we're not ready, comes five days after Yom Kippur. Judaism, says Rabbi Masbacher, is teaching us a lesson through this calendrical juxtaposition. Gam ze ya'avor, this too shall pass. When you've come through a difficult time, gam ze ya'avor, this too shall pass. It won't always be dark and difficult. Even when you can't imagine ever seeing the light again, at the same time, when you're feeling on top of the world, gamzeya of war, this too shall pass. So make time therefore to appreciate every moment of joy, as we said last week, dancing, singing, and abundance. They won't last forever, they too shall pass. And we close with Erica Brown. She found that Yiddish, has a wonderful way of coming up with expressions to express all kinds of emotions. And we conclude with this, she says, oi is also the last two letters of the word joy, perhaps a linguistic word play that makes no sense other than to communicate that one cannot experience deep and true happiness without an active range of emotions, which takes us back to the Rumi poem, as men can 
not überhalten das schlechte, kann man das gute nicht der Leben. If you can't endure the bad, you'll not live to witness the good, says the Swedish aphorism. No one wants bad news. No one opts for sadness, but it shows up as a constant friend anyway. And maybe as the saying recommends, we must invite in that sadness, not push it away because it holds the key to emotional depth that will also allow us to experience joy more completely. And I'm sure we can all agree with that, relate to that. But isn't it the same as saying that hard times makes us stronger? Yeah, okay. It doesn't mean that we look to make it happen. Of course not. Um, but um, it certainly says uh, we make the most of every moment and um, <laughs> I don't want to say something as simplistic as, and in the bad times, believe that the good times will come, but I think every one of us, that's what keeps us going, by believing that that is going to happen. And we know, I talked about an aspect of psychology earlier, um, but we all know how optimism is considered so very, very important, very important to uh, healing. Rachel, so there we, are more than a hundred emotions, so psychologists, and uh, there is an interesting connection between judgment preceding emotion. So if you look at somebody and you say, oh, this is a nice person, you probably will feel more comfortable about them. So judgments and emotions are connected. And maybe if people paid more attention to the judgments they make, they might have emotions that are easier to deal with. So there is a correlation between the two. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Bracha, I was thinking <clears throat> about these, these uh, oi and vei, right? <laughs> um, these emotions that go from positive to negative. Um, the, the most emotional person that I ever met was during the Soviet jury refusenik days was Shlomo Karlbach. We were down at City Hall for a, um, a rally. And it's a serious thing, right? We're trying to get people, <laughs> trying to get people out, of the, out, out, of, out of the Soviet Union and get to Israel. And so he organized a dance. And he says, my, and he, he came over to me. He'd never met me or other people. You're my brother. And he, he, rapped, he was known for that, of course. Wrapped he was also arms. known for saying, you're my sister. Yes. <laughs> uh, I don't have any sisters, but he, he said I was his brother. Anyways, he's, he's, he got us into a whole uh, circle and he was dancing and, and this was a serious event. Yet we were, we were all in it together and we had, he, gave us, he gave us an emotional uplift, you might say, about a serious, a very serious matter. You know, this Absolutely. It's, it's, Stand. Yeah. there's yeah. nothing like music and dance in any situation in life. Obviously, exactly. you would need dancing that's appropriate for that moment, but that's something that goes beyond words. Goes there were no words. You're, you're, you're right, there were no words for it. He was just, yeah, da, 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 yeah, da. and we just going around and around. And we were young. I had the strength to do it for a half hour. <laughs> well, that reminds me of 1948. We all sang and danced in the street, and we knew very well what's coming, but we still sang and danced. Absolutely. 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 Okay. All right. Good seeing you. Um, we will talk next week about some different emotions. Of simchas. Of simchas. Of simchas. Okay. Take care.